are you satisfied with your understanding of sustainability? If you are not, imagine a journey together, a pluralistic one, with academia, innovators, startups, NGOs, all looking for solutions to the greatest challenge of our time. My name is Samuel Ettini, and this is the Sustainability Journey. Welcome to another episode of our podcast, of our journey in the world of sustainability. And today we are going at the grassroots level, listening to the voices that are often unheard and unsung, people that are fighting climate change, where and with the community that are affected the most. And today I'm very pleased to welcome Samuel Caranja Muni, the director of NECOFA, Network for Eco Farming in Africa. Thank you, Samuel, for being here. Uh, thank you very much, Samuel. Can you give a small disclosure? Samuel is also a good friend of mine. We have been together for years, but today it is not about the work. It is about his journey and his journey towards sustainability and his outstanding work from the past more than 30 years with the community. So, Samuel, can you please tell a bit about yourself, your background, and your journey in this world, especially uh, side by side with the communities? I am honored to participate in this interview. I was born 65 years ago, a firstborn son to peasant families, uh, parents in the rural setting of uh, Elbagon in Nakuru County. For over 40 years, as a professional in agriculture and community development, I have served in many parts of Kenya especially in the arid and semi-arid, working with rural resource poor farmers and pastoralists. I have worked in uh, the public service and also for many years in the NGO world. In the course of my work, I have gained a lot of knowledge, and skills and experience in sustainable agriculture with which I promote in, uh, with rural communities, schools, and other learning institutions. I have learned a lot from the people themselves, from the different situations that I have found myself in, from trainings locally and internationally. And I can say it's been a journey of learning and a journey of empowering others. Thank you so much, Samuel. This is really interesting. And in the past years, you have worked with the NGOs and you have founded and you are at the core of NECOFA, the Network for Eco Farming in Africa. Can you tell a bit more about the context where you are dealing and working with the communities and which are the problems that are affecting them? Maybe I take this opportunity to also talk about the organization I lead, Network for Eco Farming in Africa, NECOFA, which is a non governmental organization in Kenya that we started in the year 2003. And NECOFA is also present in a number of other African countries. In Kenya, we chose the path of NGO and we operate in a number of uh, counties in this uh, country, focusing on education, environment, food and nutrition security. We work with rural communities in their groups, women groups, men groups, and even youth groups, and schools, and also other learning institutions. Now, in the course of our work, especially in the arid and the semi-arid areas of Kenya, and also in the highland areas where there's uh, a lot of small-scale farming, we have encountered a number of problems that our communities have to contend with and which erode the gains we have made in terms of uh, sustainable agriculture development. The unpredictable weather patterns of recent is a big challenge to the community. It affects their planning and also their seasons. In the process, it leads to poor yields and also consequently reduced household incomes. 
In the highlands, because of the increased population, there is also increased subdivision of the agricultural land. I must say, Kenya, like many other African countries, the land distribution is quite unfair. It is in this part of the world where the people who don't need land for livelihood own a lot of land. And the people who need land for livelihood, especially women, have little ownership and access to this land. Consequently, the majority of the small-scale farmers share very little land, and they, they continue subdividing this between their children. So the land is becoming smaller and smaller, and the, the agricultural enterprise is becoming less viable and less viable. Because of this uh, unpredictable weather and um, high rain for sometimes prolonged droughts, we have this also uh, high levels of degradation, leading to soil fertility loss and also loss of grazing land, especially in the arid and the semi arid areas of Kenya. Cost of agricultural production is also quite high, which again reduces the viability of the farming enterprise and the household income. Infrastructure that would otherwise support marketing and sale of farm produce is also another challenge. When it rains, many small scale farms are not accessible. Unfortunately, although we have two levels of government, the national and the county governments, there's still very low institutional support by the government to the small scale farmers and to the pastoral. The Agriculture Extension Service is skeleton, a shadow of its former self. The farmers don't access production information in good time. This also in the arid and semi-arid areas, and even partly in the highlands, there's also a lot of competition over natural resources, especially water, land, and other production factors. I think, as you said, there is a problem with yields that, you know, the subdivision of land is creating, the problem of the network, the infrastructure, and the access to information that is a big problem that is hindering, you know, the, the small-scale farmers. For the people, they don't know, you know, this area and the importance. Can you, since you have been here and you are born even in this area of the Mao where it, it is critical for conservation and, and for indigenous community, can you tell a bit the, the communities, which is the subject that we are talking about and a bit of their background? So to understand why, you know, we need to put indigenous community really at the forefront of climate change. And that is what we heard a lot, especially in Glasgow. You know, indigenous community are the ones that they can conserve and they need to put back again. So if you can tell a bit about the context and your community. Where I live is Molo. Molo is in the Nakuru County, which is in the central part of the Rift Valley. And we are on the Mao Forest, which is the largest uh, water tower in Kenya. We are at, at an altitude of 2,500 in Molo town, but the area continues to about 3,000 meters above sea level. This area receives very high rainfall, and it has very rich clay loam soils, very fertile and very ideal for agricultural production. It is the area where during the colonial times, the settler farmers decided to make home and called the area the White Highlands. And, and they opened a lot of land, clearing a lot of uh, forest to allow for uh, farming. And they left behind large scale farms that after independence were acquired by the Africans gradually. Now, there are many forms of land acquisition and ownership in this part of the country. We have the individuals who had access to resources who still have large scale farms. We have a few government supported settlement schemes in the area where the landless were identified from the villages and they were settled 
for a long term loan payment by the government. This is approximately five acres per family. We also have others who bought land through cooperative. People who came together, bought shares, and bought off the settler farmer, and then subdivided the land to themselves. In this area, we also had huge plantation forests. These are plantation forests that were established by the colonial government after clearing the indigenous trees. And also in the subsequent years, they are established by the Kenya government under the Kenya Forest Service. So if this area is a source of food for the rest of the country, for the bigger part of the country, measuring with uh, maize, potatoes, milk, and uh, a variety of vegetables, and even wood products. It is indeed a very large uh, production area. It is where we source food for the country. Unfortunately, it was by, not by design, but during the colonial times, the two communities last that lived here, the Maasai and the Ogiek, were not very good in farming. The Maasai practiced livestock farming or herding outside the forest when the Ogiek act their livelihood in the forest. The Ogiek are indigenous community in the Mao that have managed the Mao for all of us. It is from the Ogiek that we inherited the Mao forest. And we still have some Ogieks in parts of Nakuru County and also others in uh, uh, other parts of Kenya. In terms of uh, the ethnic communities that were brought here to work on uh, settler farms and also to work for the forest department, to work for the railway system, the, the different ethnic communities were invited during the colonial times to come and work here. And those others came on, on their own uh, to look for employment. In the process, many settled in Molo and this region generally. So all the ethnic communities in Kenya are represented here. And each one of them with their own expertise. And uh, the European farmer easily identified that and uh, developed these different skills for the different uh, uh, ethnic communities. So this is one part of the country where we see the face of Kenya. From this region, several rivers emerge from the Mao Forest to major lakes and um, tourist attraction sites, including the Masai Mara, many rivers, including Lake Victoria, Lake Nakuru, Lake Baringo, Lake Naivasha, all the, what would you call the Great Lakes of uh, the Rift Valley have their waters from the Mao Forest. It is a very important place in the country, in the region, and of mm. course in Africa. It's really important. This leads me because, you know, we can even say that the Nile and the Masai Mara and, and the Lake Victoria, they take water. Some of the sources are from here and the Masai Mara, of course, is well known all over the world. So from your work with the community, especially with the indigenous community, which have been the impact of the work and the deforestation and also the way also conservation was done, not putting at the center the indigenous community. The communities that lived here were not a threat in any way to the ecosystem and the forest because they lived in harmony with nature, traditionally and in practice. The Ogeek, for example, depended 100% on the forest. They hunted small, small wildlife for food. They harvested uh, vegetables in the forest. They were able to get herbs. They did a lot of beekeeping and they also built their houses inside the forest. Their practice never threatened the forest. The Maasai as well from the plains. They practiced butter trade. The Maasai provided livestock products to the Ogiek. The Ogiek provided the honey, the herbs, and other products from the forest. And this was mutual, and it was very good. Now, it is the, the money economy that was brought with the 
with a colonial settlement of the area that threatened the Mau. And this is where uh, large tracts of forest land were deforested to allow for plantation forests, to allow for crop farming, etc., etc. And I must say, uh, most of the large-scale farmers also tried in, within their means to do some level of soil conservation. Now, when the, the same land was subdivided into smaller holding farms, they are too small, for example, to allow for crop rotation. And many times you see one crop on the farm, almost monocropping in some of the lands. Now, this coupled with the climate change has resulted with a, a serious environmental degradation in the area. So going with the issue of now, the, the, the climate change induced weather and predictability, then the crop yields and livestock yields in the area have declined significantly. The returns are low for the farmers. Food insecurity is creeping in. The food we were able to sell before to other parts of the country has reduced. The small scale farms are gradually becoming unsustainable to manage. Now, the torrential rainfall that comes with climate change creates a lot of soil degradation and the loss of soil fertility. And worse, it also becomes a menace to the water bodies, including the rivers and the lakes through siltation and the pollution. So in the process, the, the agricultural land loses its soil fertility and uh, productivity, and the rivers and lakes become less habitable for by aquatic creatures, including fish in Lake Baringo and other areas. Now, the competition for pasture and water, which is a consequence of the reducing or the fluctuating river levels, many times result in conflicts. And in some areas, especially in Baringo and other parts of the country, this translates to armed conflict. People lose their lives, property, and even moved from their homes. Now, climate change has increased the temperatures in the area. And this has resulted in it decreased pests and diseases for livestock, for crop, and even for humans. Surprisingly, I never saw a mosquito in Molo until the mid 80s and the 90s. Before that, we never had mosquitoes. Now we do. Then you see the other thing, when the rain fed the agriculture, which is the small scale agriculture practiced by the majority of the farmers here, is low in terms of productivity, then it becomes less attractive to the youth. So what happens? The youth are opting to leave the farms to go to the cities. And when that happens, the youth are leaving the, the weak and elderly parents to continue with the farming and denying agriculture, youthful creativity and energy. So these old people, my, my age mates and above, and, more, and older are left to the farming. The youth are leaving because farming is no longer a viable enterprise for some of the small scale farms. So with limited options, the, the communities naturally look for alternative means of livelihood. And unfortunately, there is a product or from the forest, forest products are there is a victims of uh, are communities with limited options. Now, the, the, many of them resort to deforestation for making of charcoal and also for harvesting of for fuel. And in the process, they also contribute to the loss of biodiversity and increased vulnerability to climate change. It is a vicious cycle we are in. Again, because of the reliability of the, like I said, about the youth, going to the cities. What happens in the cities? There is higher unemployment, more youth than the jobs. Many even opt to migrate to other countries, whether legally or illegally. Food insecurity is a major issue that leads to malnutrition. 
this may not be seen very much in Molo, but of course, further away from Molo, you'll see the signs of malnutrition and poor health. And what happens after that? Then the people's productivity is reduced. Because of this struggle, the community wildlife conflicts are increasing everywhere within the Mao and other parts of the country. Climate change is a real menace and a big threat to our livelihood. Wow. Samuel, thank you so much for this comprehensive and very clear picture. You know, you have shown exactly the impact and what, you know, we heard a lot in Glasgow discussing why the indigenous, why the impact and the work of the climate change, how is impacting, and also the logical consequences. So, you know, from what seems like, you know, just farmers, you know, having yields problem, it is a chain that unlock migration, that can unlock conflict, and then can really disturb ecosystem. So thank you, Samuel, for this uh, comprehensive and very clear also statement that is also a very strong statement for the people listening. Samuel, then I want to ask you this question. You know, which solution then are you, with your means, of course, because are you trying to provide and with which approach, how we can reverse uh, this system and this chain that is in marginalizing communities, especially indigenous community? Well, I think that it is actually urgent that we attend to these issues. It is now a matter of life and death for many of the communities in this country because of the threats and challenges associated with climate change. It is very important that we build the resilience of these communities through increased support to small-scale farming, improved infrastructure, road networks, access to information, strengthen the agricultural extension service, either by government or even by the NGOs. We need to have investment in value addition and marketing of agricultural products. We need to reduce on-farm wastage. We need to reduce transportation wastage. We need to make small-scale agriculture viable as a means of livelihood and also to attract agro-based industries, even if it means the government providing some incentives to the investor. We need to strengthen the cooperative movement because the smallholder farmer is easily exploited by middlemen when they don't operate as a corporate. The economics of scale cannot apply to a small smallholder. It can only apply to a group of many small scale holders. This needs to be done. It needs deliberate action by government, deliberate action by NGOs, deliberate action by the donor community. The other thing is now to so promote conservation agriculture that is based on water harvesting and agroforestry. This is critical, even if it means partnership between the South and the North in enhancing these practices for our common good, because these practices sequester carbon. And it's not just for Kenya, it's for the world. So the more we increase on this, viable green uh, practices, the better for the country. We need also to have increased community access, affordable green energy, tax zero rated energy for the communities to reduce their pressure on the forest products. They need to be encouraged to use other forms of energy. We need to have increased community access to universal health care so that the community health is improved and a people's productivity is high. We need also to have increased access to finance and good infrastructure. We need to have the finance not from depending on banks, but also looking at evolution, assisting the, the cooperatives into formation of circle societies so that the farmers can access finance at a low interest rates. We need to support programs for integrated pest and disease management by government. This should be stepped up. The communities may not be able to address, for example, the locust menace on their own, the ambient one. 
and others. For the livestock areas, especially in the arid and the semi-arid, we need to have better management of livestock in terms of husbandry and also in terms of fodder, storage and management. But more important, a very organized and reliable livestock offtake system where the communities are encouraged to sell their livestock just before the onset of drought period. We need to have promotion of food biodiversity based on traditional drought tolerant crops, both in the highlands, in the arid and the semi-arid areas. We need to develop more recipes and research done on this tradition of food, which are the sure gates to food security in Kenya and in Africa. Thank you, Samuel. This is really, I can say, a manifesto that should be heard from people because it's really going into the practicalities, how we can really unlock the potential, enable small-scale farmer produce, and solve the way the food we produce for a growing population in the planet in a sustainable and friendly way to our planet. Not again the exploitative agriculture, but the culture that you said, I think at the end is really important. You know, the traditional knowledge, the work that is enshrined with the people that have conserved this critical era for so many years. I really want to thank you, Samuel, so much for your passion. And then from this manifesto, it's really touched me. It's really important. And it should be hard by especially not only in Kenya, but to the world. For somebody that is listening, you know, and we have listeners from all over the planet, from America to Australia to Af- other parts of Africa or Europe, what, what I can do as my little contribution? What I would wish to see in the near future is an increased government commitment towards improving the rural economies and livelihoods. This needs to be seen of our government and other governments in Africa and also support from other well-wishers. I also need to see a lot of focus at global level on the loss loss and damage in the future climate change discussion. This campaign needs to be taken by everybody. It is not an African campaign. It is a campaign for all of us. We need also to see more financing for small-scale agriculture and agroforestry. I would wish to see increased commitment to climate change or, or pollution emissions reduction, especially by, by governments from the north, not giving lip service, but now giving more practical promises and actions. I would also wish to see a lot of support for youth initiatives in the South. Now, as a message, climate change is a global threat to humanity, but Africa is suffering the most. Our suffering will affect the comfort of everybody else, even in the North. Our youth will come to share the comfort in the North if nothing is done about it. So much as we suffer in the South, my age mates and the older will be fine with that. We, we don't have a choice. But our youth may not wait to suffer in Africa. They'll come to share whatever there is in the north. And that is going to disturb the comfort of everybody else. It is possible for all of us to tame climate change if indeed all of us are committed to do it. Thank you, Samuel, for this message and your four strong points. You have summarized really the points taken out from COP and that we'll need to take to COP27 in Egypt, that will be a COP in Africa, where your demand will be need to be on the table. And I like what you say, stop lip service, we need to work. And we really need to be together. We cannot have people in a position of comfort and other suffering. We need also to look at the job to be done and work together. I have no word to thank you, Samuel, for this passionate work that you have done and for the time that you are sharing with the community, the outstanding work you are doing with the communities in Kenya, with the indigenous community and the farmers. So, I really want to thank you so much. It was a a big honor for me to having you. And I'm sure we will come back to discuss and see and evaluate again the progress towards this big journey. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a great honor. All the best. Thank you. Are you satisfied after this wonderful episode? Let's continue together. 
our sustainability journey.